So, when last we left our heroes, they were thirsty, girl. But not like Jersey Shore DTF. They were thirsty for blood. Most specifically, the blood of the Romans. So, I guess they are DTF? If DTF means damned if I... Well, the other meaning probably applies here, too. Upon receiving the message from King Arthur that the Britons are coming to wreck their collective... <laughs> Lucius Tiberius and the Roman Senate were like, Aw, oh, hell no. Nah. A proclamation was sent to the kings of the Orient to form an army in order to conquer Britain. Correctly this time, I guess. So Rome and their allies set out in August towards Britain. Once Arthur hears of this, he arranges for his nephew, Mordred... Huh, that name sounds familiar to rule and defend Britain in his absence. In later Arthurian tales, the story between them is perverted, and I don't mean just because of the incest stuff, but yeah, also that. At this point in time, however, the character of Mordred is simply the son of Arthur's sister, Anna, and is the brother of Gawain and the nephew of Arthur. And that's it. Not as exciting that way, which is probably why later versions spice things up a bit. Drama! But anyways, Arthur sets out for Southampton with a huge fleet of ships, and... I guess the exertion of arranging a war against Rome causes him to slip into a deep slumber, complete with fever dreams. His most relevant dream consists of a bear flying over the lands that causes the very shores to quake when he growls, and a dragon that lights up the sky as it flies in from the west. When the two meet, they, you guessed it, fight. The dragon attacks relentlessly until the bear falls from the sky, scorched and defeated. When Arthur awakes, he has his crew decipher the dream for him, and they're like, Stop eating Baconators laced with magic mushrooms before bed. Also, the dream is about you kicking- Wow! Do not worry about the fact that your name means bear. There's no correlation to be had there. Arthur isn't convinced, but at dawn they arrive at Barfleur, where they pitch their tents and await the other kings. But of course, things can't go that smoothly. Word reaches Arthur that there's an evil Spanish giant who kidnapped Helena, the daughter of Duke Hole, and took her to the peak of Mont Saint Michael. It's an island in Normandy, France, FYI. No knights have yet been able to defeat the giant. Those who attempt to siege the island by sea are sank into the murky depths, and those that make it to the island are eaten alive. So you know what that means. It's my quest o'clock. We knew there was no way we could just focus on the task at hand. Joffrey, you forgot to take your pills again, dude. But in this story, Arthur is not yet a cuckolded wuss like in the French romances. He's a bona fide baddest, so he doesn't even need his army. He just snags Kay and Bedivere at 2 a.m. for some death-defying hijinks. So they're off to the island. I prefer 2 a.m. mochi donut runs, but hey, to each their own. As they're sailing, they see two lit fires glowing in the night. Arthur sends Bedivere out on a solo mission to investigate the first fire, which is apparently atop a Chinese-style mountain in the middle of the sea. Betty climbs to the top and finds an old lady wailing piteously. When she sees him, she immediately relays her tragic backstory. Run while you can! This horrible giant is thirsty as yes. He just tried to rape Elena to death, but she died of fright, so he had to go with me! You're really pretty. Get out of here or he'll rape you to death too! Also, don't ask how I survived giant rape. Just, just don't think about it. And Bedivere's just like, Damn, I, uh, I, damn, you. Fuck me, um, I'll be right back. Don't, don't go anywhere. So he just leaves her and goes back to Arthur like, What the f*** did we just get ourselves into? They're both sad about the girl, but as sad as Arthur is, he is equally motivated. He decides that this is a solo mission. So they sail to the other fire, which is burning atop a larger mountain. King Arthur climbs the peak alone, where he sees the giant, with blood all over his face, gnawing on some pig entrails. Aww, somebody's a messy eater. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. The giant grabs his club, which is so large that it would take more than two men to budge, and is about to take a swing at Arthur. Arthur raises his shield and dives at the giant, trying to land a hit before he can swing the club. The giant is surprisingly fast, and hits Arthur's shield, the sound of which sends reverberations all the way out to the shore and causes Arthur's ears to ring. 
In retaliation, Arthur smacks the giant on the forehead with his sword. And although the giant was able to slightly block the blow with his club, he sprang blood all over the place and is temporarily blinded. Pissed off, the giant lunges at Arthur and manages to tackle him to the ground. But Arthur slinks out of the hold and starts slicing and dicing at the giant until he manages to punch the whole of his sword into the giant's skull. Then the giant goes out of death row and falls to the ground dead. Arthur sends for Bedivere to saw off the giant's head so that they can take it back to camp. I don't know, some kids might want to play with it and it would make for a great photo shoot. Filled with adrenaline from the recent slaughter, Arthur hits peak euphoria and begins to reminisce about the time he slayed this giant named Retho on Mount Arvaeus. Retho apparently had a beard fetish, as he collected the beards of all the kings he slayed and made a swanky little fur cloak out of them. Well, wasn't he a talented fellow? He should have started a neat tea shop. He sent a message to Arthur one day, ordering him to tear his beard off and to send it to him through priority mail. If he did, he would sew it higher up on the cloak than the other beards. But if he didn't, Arthur would have to fight with them. What do you think happened? Arthur made pretty short work of him, and as an act of obstinance, he took the giant's beard as a victory prize. And he wound up with a lovely cloak for his troubles. Hmm, nice. He was the envy of the court with that on, I tell you what. Why was this brought up? Does it have anything to do with anything? I guess it just adds more notches to Arthur's baddest belt. No. Oh. So the three head back to camp with the giant's head as the day is about to break, and everybody gets up and is all... Whoa, cool giant head! Awesome job killing, brah! Give me a pound, doggy! I hope they're not planning to cart that smelly thing all the way to Rome. Howell is sad about his niece, so he has some dudes erect a chapel on the site where she was buried, aka Helena's tomb. And purportedly, the site still exists to this day. And by to this day, I'm guessing Joffrey's referring to his time period because the official site doesn't have Jack Diddley Squad on any Helena Chapel or Helena Tomb. Even after interwebs detectiving, I couldn't find anything for a Helena in Mont St. Michael. There is, however, a mausoleum of Helena in Rome, Italy. Anyways, the kings Arthur has been waiting for show up and they march to Aton, hoping to run into the emperor. Sadly, he was out of the office at the time. So instead, as Arthur and his men were about to reach the river Abe, they find out that the Emperor's camp is nearby. So Arthur sets up camp on the riverbank and sends out Bozo... Bozo? Of Oxford and Garen of Chartres. Chartres? Ugh, these freaking names. Oh, and he's with his nephew Gawain! Hi, buddy! And they're sent to Lucius with a message. We doing this or what? Cause all signs point to me owning this sh all this trash talking and grandstanding has the young men in the camp fired up, shown in anime style. <laughs> they egg on Gawain to start some shit with the Romans, and despite being prone to peer pressure, Gawain really wants to F with the Romans. So he is down with the proverbial sickness. He and the boys head over to see Lucius, and they start smack talking. Either we about to go, or you about to go. No! Twitch Gaius Quintilanius? Quin? Hold on. Quintilanus? What the hell is this name? Anyway, to which Gaius Q, Lucius' nephew, responds that the Britons sure can talk the talk, but they cannot walk the walk. Gawain responds to this extremely flaccid insult in the way that any reasonable human being would. He rushes at Gaius and cuts off his head. <laughs> Strongly worded letter to follow. Guess the boys got their wish. But rather than fighting there, which would be suicide, though maybe not with the way this book's biased, Gawain and his men mount their horses and we get a good old fashioned car chase scene. As they're racing from the Romans, they manage to hack and slash some dudes as they catch up to them. Marcellus Mutinus, while doing his best to catch up to Gawain in order to revenge the death of Gaius, fails spectacularly as Gawain simply swings around and cleaves him in two from head to chest and states that this is why the Britons are so good at boasting and making threats. 
because they're master baiters. So they continue on horsing and killing their enemies one by one, not losing a single man. This is almost like watching a spaghetti western. Going in the Britons are the cowboys and the Romans are the Native Americans. <laughs> As they're about to reach the woods, suddenly about 6,000 Britons, who, I guess, got the memo, come rushing out of hiding and capture and kill a buttload of Roman soldiers. Senator Petrius gets wind of this and takes charge with an additional 10,000 men. He comes to the aid of the remaining troops and manages to force the Britons back to the woods, which is a really bad idea because apparently the British get a plus 10 attack bonus in grass and woodland terrain. But even though the Romans lose a bunch more dudes, the Britons have now entered berserker mode which means that they've lost their ability to strategize. Petrius takes advantage of the fact that the Britons are disorganized, and they start killing dudes in mass. Bozo takes note of this, and rallies the bravest among the Britons by stating, Hey guys, I have a great idea. Let's don't die. That would look like really bad. Arthur will totally bro scold our corpses. Let's try to kill or capture that Petrius guy. That's probably a good move. Yeah, let's do that. And to make a long story short, they succeed. Now I know what y'all are thinking. It's a tad sus that the Roman military, the mightiest and most fearsome military of the time period, was getting shit pwned by strategies that make the Langrisser series look like it was written by Sun Tzu, but... Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs>